can find your presentation and just go through it quickly so that you can see that you, you have access to all the slides. Slides? <clears throat> no, Paul, we know that you don't have a presentation. That's fine. No, I don't. I don't. I do it. Uh, it's be confusing. That's fine. That's my exactly. Exactly. I, I'd be delighted to have slides, but I don't have them. So no Thank no that's absolutely fine so paul thank you very much for being on time we're just waiting for mm -hmm. as you can see the rest of the uh of the participants to join and that should happen any second now so i'm just going to put you on mute for a couple minutes and we'll get started Hey, Cosmin, this is Jamie. Can you hear me? Hello, can you hear me? Hey, Cosmin, yeah, we can hear you. So we Do just want to tell me. On. So we just want to make sure that we can see your presentation correctly. So in the um, in the visible screen, there is a button called playlist. Can you see it? Okay. So should I share or should I not share? Because I not share. Yeah. So we're going to do it from within the actual um, the actual browser. So if you could open the Visibo again, please, and go to playlist. Sure. So I need to uh, playlist playlist yeah. playlist. Yeah. And then on the right hand side, um, underneath the names of the participants, there's there is Cosme and Cosmo. Yeah. yeah, you've got it. We can see it. It's perfect. Okay, so this is, this is something that I should do. Yes, that would be perfect. And hi, it's Alessandra here. Uh, just a question, Cosme. Do you have any uh, effects? It's a PDF. No, it's, it's a PDF. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's perfect. Then it uh, will work absolutely perfectly. The only person who will need a screen share is Azana. So it's perfect. All right, lovely. Thanks. So I you. will need I will need to uh, to exchange pages. That's it. Yeah. Exactly. When you're ready, just change the page, and we're good to go. Okay. Uh, and uh, who should start this presenting? Yeah. So I will start that. All right, so that will be me, and then you'll be responsible for changing the slide. Okay. Good. Thank you. Uh, so if you can all just sit tight for another couple of minutes, we are just waiting for a few more people here and we'll be with you very, very shortly.
Jim?
Testing, testing. Tell me when we're going to launch, when you hear it and when you see it. When is it streaming or is it already streaming? Oh, wow, so we can welcome the people. So, Kelt, first of all, take a seat. The other speakers uh, are ready in their home offices, as they're called now officially. Uh, last time we had some technical challenges. This time everything has been checked and double checked. So, we feel ready for a critical mission tonight. Uh, we're going to be talking um, about the European Payment Initiative, and it's a hybrid meetup about that. Is there anything, Alessandra, I should add for the sponsors like Comet? Okay, um, that's here. why I'm here. Very Thank good. You Come too. on. <laughs> also, for everybody who doesn't know Alessandra, if you want to chip in for our events, participate, suggest anything, talk to her, talk to uh, Jamie in the back who does all the events too, and the two of them will gladly help you with your uh, fintech related events. If you like a beer, I'm, I'm in for, for that too. Huh? Um, so, uh, welcome everyone. Um, so tonight, uh, we are welcomed by Comet. As you've seen, it's really a nice atmosphere. So this is not a co-working space. It's actually a meeting space. And we have a little video that uh, Jamie is going to launch. It's only 30 seconds and it's going to show you uh, a little bit the concept. So the concept comes from uh, France and has started here in Brussels with the first uh, co-working place in Place Stéphine, not far from the Justice Bank in the city centre. And um, we have a lot of, here you have 30 meeting spaces from this big space with very high tech and uh, to smaller uh, and uh, you have a great uh, terrace on the second floor that you haven't seen and you have seen the gorgeous uh, rooftop terrace. And uh, the place here on every, um, every floor has been dedicated to a different country or a different uh, type of atmosphere. Here we are uh, obviously in Mexico. But you have also uh, uh, India, you have Japan, and uh, and all the floors have got this uh, diff different uh, atmosphere. They knew there was a pandemic coming, right? So they were <laughs> travel just in the office. Exactly. Very smart, Work from very home and whenever you need an office, come here. That was the idea. So thank you very much to Comet and, um, yeah, and enjoy. Uh, I we will keep it very short. We will go straight to the first uh, speaker, who is uh, Thibaut de Barcy, who will give us the introduction about uh, yeah, what API is about, and uh, I'm I'm gonna first of all introduce yourself and tell me what is emerging or still emerging about the payment initiative. You have to unmute yourself. Sorry, we can't hear you yet. So the unmute button or the technical room has to unmute you. Let's see who's first. Ta da! You are presenting. That we can see. We still don't hear you. You're up there. You're, yeah, you're, you're, you're in a different spot on the screen, but you're still as muted as you were. So if you can find a way. Yeah, victory. Sorry, it's, I think it's the technical. I had to release it first. OK, guys, the Emerging Payment Association was uh, started in London 10 years ago, and we are the spin-off for the European Union. And basically, we are a business club of uh, decision makers in the payment industry. And we are covering the whole of the European Union from Luxembourg, which Paul Scholten knows well because he used to work here. So uh, you guys are all welcome uh, whenever you like in Luxembourg. We'll be glad to welcome you. But we'll soon organize events all across Europe, including Brussels, obviously. You are all invited. Okay, great. And I will invite the online participants, uh, the 15 of them about. I saw that they can also ask questions in the room chat. So don't hesitate if you have uh, questions to, to address the speaker. Uh, it's not for self-advertising, so make sure that it is a real question. Otherwise, we will not relay it. So, floor is yours, Thibault. Go ahead, explain us. Very good. So, um, let me tell you, I will do this in a bit of provocative way. So, I hope it's just to stimulate the debate, right? 
So the European Payments Initiative, it's a bit um, of uh, I love you, me neither history between Europe and the United States. Uh, why? Because the starting point, and um, the guys from the EPI do not hide this, is a sovereignty problem. It's the idea that an ill American president might decide suddenly to cut Visa and MasterCard services in one European country in favor of a European company or uh, against European interest. Has it happened yet? Not exactly. It happened with WikiLeaks and it happened with a very small Venezuelan bank. Okay, so that's, that's the history. Um, what is it all about? Well, it's a great idea, actually. It's to say today we have uh, instant payments, which is uh, almost available everywhere. And on the other hand, we have open banking. So if we combine both, you could have a European payment solution, which would be um, very instantaneous. That means the merchant would have its payment almost instantaneously. And we would be using existing infrastructure, which is supposed to be very cheap. Fantastic. OK, great. Who started this? It's a private initiative, but it was started initially by a group of French banks and they have invited other banks in Europe. So now there are about 30 banks and they are collaborating on the first version of the EPI. So for now, no one else is allowed to go in the EPI. It's a private club. They test the ID between themselves and then they will invite others. And by the way, it's not a surprise that it's a French ID because in France, they have something very similar, which is Carte Bancaire, which is the group of French banks having a common payment mean. And actually it's the idea that we could leverage this at a, a European scale. So when uh, actually they are, they are very ambitious, they are targeting beginning of 2022. Um, a lot of people are very skeptical about this, but. I think that the idea is that they might have a first version, probably um, materialized not by a card yet, but by a mobile app, which will probably have, a, which will probably be a common mobile app between those uh, banks and having limited coverage at start. But well, you have to start somewhere, right? Now, the biggest question is how much will it cost and who will finance this? Because we are probably talking about at least 10 billion euros, probably 20, 30, 40, no one knows. And one of the big issues is, can this be a private initiative um, to the end? Will it be entirely financed by private means? Or will they need some public financing? But if they want, and if they have public financing, then it might create some kind of a distortion in the market. Another big question is, of course, the coverage, because uh, it's great to have a new payment means within Europe. But uh, this is where, of course, Visa and MasterCard have a fantastic product covering the whole world. Now, the EPI already said they are ready to work with uh, other players in the world, uh, offering them um, roaming capabilities. But it's still a mystery at this stage. And then last but not least, let me um, conclude on a, on a small humorous note because we, we uh, at the Emerging Payment Association, we had the chance of having a, a private meeting with Martina Weimert from uh, the EPI. Um, and I asked her, okay, this is about sovereignty rights, but we know that big European banks, uh, for example, Deutsche Bank, are moving their infrastructure to American clouds. Uh, for example, Deutsche Bank is going with Google Cloud. So does that mean that this purely European system might one day rely on American cloud? Well, the answer is yes. Why? Because if we are talking about the European entities of those uh, big cloud companies, they are perfectly allowed legally to offer their services to a project such as EPI. But this is just to conclude on a humorous note. Thank you so much. So big thanks, and I'm afraid it's not as humorous because amongst DPOs, there's very big debates whether hosting on a US-owned company's infrastructure is indeed uh, the, the compliant thing to do. So that debate, we won't solve it here, but it's a big one. It's playing on a very large scale, of course. So thanks for setting the scene. Uh, 
I, I would say, Kiel, yeah, you are from a, a consulting division. Eh? The, uh, as, as, you have to pitch yourself better than I can do this. But I was going to ask you, can you tell us what the state is and what you see in the market from your perspective? Hello, hot mic. Fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> Fantastic. So yeah, very quickly. So Azana, we're a consulting firm specialized in payments and cash management. So where we help on one side corporates with their, their treasury management problem, uh, interim treasury management, uh, that can be improving their treasury tools and processes. We also work with banks in terms of product management, uh, their strategy, as well as solution providers, fintechs, uh, clearings, but everyone involved in the, in the payments chain. And throughout that, we've been able to get a few insights into EPI, but the insights are still somewhat limited, mainly for two reasons. The first reason is that there are still a lot of things that have been undecided. There's clearly a lot of time pressure to get things done by 2022, 23, that's the, the ambitious timeline. And at the same time, there's a huge amount of ambition. So there's still a lot of discussion amongst the member banks of how they're going to reduce that ambition or what the minimum viable product of AP could look like. The second thing is that there's very strict NDAs with uh, with AP. Uh, I'm not sure what it exactly contains. It's also under NDA probably, but it would seem to me that uh, if you say anything about AP, you lose your firstborn child. So take everything with a grain of salt. It's it's uh, still a work in progress. So first of all, why should we care about uh, about AP and about card payments? Well, first of all, it's an enormously growing market. If we're looking at Belgium, for example, um, just five years ago, we were at 1.5 billion uh, cards, uh, 1.5 billion transactions per year. Um, and now if we're projecting up to 2027, so four year, five years from now, we'll be close to three and a half, four billion transactions. That's an enormous amount. Um, that's only been accelerated with, uh, with the sanitary crisis. People are more comfortable. People have gotten, figured out that you can pay contactless and that it's easy. So it's an enormous market. To understand where, where AP is going, uh, we need to understand what card payments are about. Um, and I, I know there are some people that are working in the card payments industry here who will know that I'm grossly oversimplifying here, but just to situate where, where AP is, a little introduction. So essentially card payments, they work with a, what we call a four corner model. You have a consumer and a merchant and the consumer wants to buy some goods at the store or at the e-commerce e point. Now, what will they do? They will present, oh, there's something going wrong with the presentation, there we go. So they'll present their card to the, uh, the merchant and the merchant then sends that information electronically onto their acquirer. The acquirer will then pass through what we call a card scheme. Now those card schemes are the ones that Igor was talking about, the American ones, the MasterCard Visa. In Belgium, we also have our domestic card scheme being Bankonta. And they'll contact the acquirer with the issuer. The issuer is the bank, essentially, that's, emit, uh, that's been emitting the card. And they will then provide an authorization saying, yes, there's enough money on the account. We promise that you, the acquirer, will then be paid. The merchant, through their acquirer, will then get, receive that authorization request. And then they know they can give the good or the service to their customer. So that's just the authorization part. Then there's the payment part, the actual financial flows. So obviously, if I pay with my card, then my bank is going to debit my account. So the issuer gets the full transaction amount. Now, that full transaction amount doesn't actually find its way back to, uh, to the merchant. Um, through a clearing and settlement mechanism, in fact, the issuer will through the scheme, provide the money to the acquirer minus what we call an interchange fee. So that's the, the, the issuer bank's commission for doing that transaction. 
there's a scheme fee, so that's the money that's going to MasterCard and Visa. And uh, the, the acquirer will then pass the money on to the merchant, again, taking part of their fee. So, so now where will IPI sit? IPI will in fact be its own scheme. So it'll be right in the middle here, connecting the issuers to the acquirers. So obviously there's, there's quite a big component to build there. On top of that, the, the idea behind IPI is to leverage the existing infrastructure. So the idea would be to use the instant payments mechanism for the settlement of those transactions. So where instant payment transactions could then be used to take care of the flows between issuer and acquirer. Now, what are the challenges that we're facing there? Well, first of all, it's a question of the chicken and the egg. So we have issuers and acquirers. Acquirers will be interesting for merchants. So if you want to uh, convince merchants to accept a new scheme, there needs to be cards in circulation. No one wants to pay for a specific scheme if, if no one has the cards. And with the cards as well, if you can't use the cards anywhere at any stores, then what's the point of having those cards? So it, it's, it's really a difficult question to, to build this network and to scale it up quickly. Now Thibault was, was talking about enormous investments. Uh, and on one side, you have the technology component and actually building a platform and, and building the ecosystem. But on top of that, a large part of the investment needs to go to the second part, hopefully. Yes, next slide. Marketing, MasterCard and Visa have enormous marketing budget because they want issuers to offer their cards. They want acquirers to, uh, to accept their cards. And a large part of the AP investment and the investment that banks need to do will probably be focused on this marketing part. If we go to the next slide. So, um, yeah. I'll keep on going. Um, in any case, only having an AP card will never be enough. Why? Because you won't be able to use AP cards everywhere. You won't be able to use it in every store. You won't be able to use it, uh, next slide, please. You won't be able to use it abroad. So that's why we need to have co-brand cards. Now in Belgium, we're quite, yeah. In Belgium, we're quite familiar with co-branded cards as well. Um, you're you're walking around with a bank contact plus MySco card, uh, unless you're at, uh, at you're at BNP, then you might have a, a Visa uh, Visa debit plus uh, plus bank contact card. But it might look like we might have dual or even triple that brand. And that's also one of the big questions that's 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 being posed by all these members is what's going to happen with the domestic schemes? Is there still a place for bank contact or for carte bancaire? If there are, if there's a pan European scheme, so we still need to figure out what's going to happen there. And then finally, we was, we said that we were going to use instant payments as settlement mechanism. Again, challenges with instant payments. Now. Uh, Thibault was saying it's great for the merchant to get paid immediately, and, and on one side, I agree. On the other side, there are merchants that don't want to get paid immediately. Uh, take a Carrefour, for example, or, or a Colerette. They get thousands of transactions every day. They don't want every individual transaction in their account system. They don't want an accounting with all those transactions. They just want one transaction per store per day. And the instant payment scheme, it's payer to payee. You don't have that concept of an acquirer. So, so again, it makes these globalized credits very difficult. On top of that, in card schemes, there's this concept of an alias. Again, taking the example of a, a Carrefour, your actual payment, if you're paying in a Carrefour, is likely going to the franchise holder. So it might be going to a Francois management company. You don't want to see that on your account statement. You want to see uh, Carrefour, uh, Tubis. It's the same thing with the time that it actually takes. So if you're going to rely on, on the instant payment, the timeout for a payment is 20 seconds. Now, instant payments, we're looking at credit transfer use cases, peer to peer payments. That's incredibly fast. It takes 20 minutes at a store. Oh, or sorry, 20 seconds at a store. That's a very long time to be standing behind the cash register. And finally, to initiate the payment, there's a, a pan-European scheme called Request to Pay, 
Now the question is, will API be leveraging that, that standard European uh, uh, scheme to, to leverage, to, to initiate the payment, or will they develop something custom? So a lot of questions still about the, the scheme and the capabilities. So yeah, again, very interesting to see where it'll go. Huge investments that are required. A lot of questions uh, that are that are still open. But uh, looking to forward to seeing where it'll go and to debating with my colleagues on the topic. We're, we're going to have a debate amongst ourselves and with the online uh, audience at the very end of it. So we're going to move forward to our next speaker who uh, has a greatly alliterating for, uh, Cosmin Co Cosma. I'm very disappointed your company doesn't alliterate as well. And so it's Thinkware. I, I think fair would have been great uh, <laughs> if you get to uh, also charge for what the, the PSD2 things you're doing. I think your sound is still a muted too. We don't hear you yet. So I get uh, yeah, that's, that's right now. You hear you me? Fine. Yep. And so uh, sure. I was just going to introduce you. You're gonna, going to enlighten us about the status of PSD2 in Eastern and Central Europe, right? Yes, so. I will speak a bit on uh, from our perspective from here in uh, Central and Eastern Europe. I will change the camera so that you can see me better. Uh, hi, everybody. Regards from Bucharest. Uh, here it is a very, very sunny and warm day. I don't know how is the time in Blue, uh, Brussels. I heard that there is some beer there. Indeed. Yes, we yes we do. You, yeah, you see, it's so, e we even allowed to drink it during our meeting. This is nothing. Uh, this is water. So I'm also at, at my office. Okay. Uh, so uh, thank you very much for inviting me here. Uh, I, I see uh, I see a lot of very good uh, discussions on uh, on very specific topics in terms of payment. Uh, my presentation is done also as an introduction uh, because I'm I'm from far away somehow. Uh, to Belgium, uh, an introduction from uh, uh, from our side, from uh, Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, I had two heads here. One is uh, the fact that I'm the president of Romanian FinTech Association, uh, and I represent uh, uh, our association here in Romania. And also I have the second head of being the co-founder and CEO of Finkware, uh, one of uh, uh, European uh, uh, open banking aggregators for uh, API. Uh, APIs based on PSD2 and not not only, uh, which operates here in uh, in uh, in Romania from Romania. Uh, I will speak uh, as, uh, shortly about uh, I don't know how to, ah here uh, shortly about the the fintech association. Like like your association, we are as, uh, an association having all the startups in the fintech ecosystem here in Romania, most of the startups, let's say 80%, 90% of the startups, but they, there are not so many, uh, let me put it this way. Uh, we uh, This is a very, very uh, early stage, uh, let's say, industry in Romania. Uh, but starts with uh, with a lot of uh, uh, I don't know optimism. Uh, we have, for example, uh, PayPact, uh, one uh, insure tech, which is right now in the final of Luxembourg House of Financial Technology Catapult Accelerator. Uh, we have uh, uh, businesses that are uh, that are uh, going further uh, the uh, Romanian uh, border and uh, have cross-border operations. Uh, we are also uh, uh, supported by the banks. So the fact that what we do here is also to put in contact as much as we can the banks, the incumbents with the new uh, FinTech startups so that uh, uh, they uh, uh, source uh, innovation from, uh, from our uh, labs and uh, we uh, have uh, their uh, uh, invoicing data so that we can charge uh, something to them. Uh, it is the case sometime in the in the life of a startup. Uh, when I uh, this is about the Romania uh, the Romania fintech association. If you come to Romania as a fintech expert, just uh, give me a call. We can uh, have here a, a, a glass of water or a beer. I don't know, and uh, we can discuss on fintech innovation uh, as well in Bucharest. Uh, Going back for uh, my business, what we are doing, uh, you know, uh, we do uh, fintech uh, API data aggregation in, at FinCorp. I believe everybody knows about the big, new, big news today with uh, uh, Visa uh, taking uh, over or, I don't know, trying the second try of Visa to take over a big aggregator in open banking uh, uh, infrastructure uh, scene. Uh, they bid it for the... They, they announced acquisition of Tink, 
but they are still pending the uh, European Commission approval. Uh, my bet would be uh, 100, uh, 100 euros that uh, they won't get the European uh, Commission approval. I don't know. Is there anybody betting other? Uh, and the bets are open. Here we go. And okay, the first one. We have a hundred here. Who has more? <laughs> we have a hundred here. We're gonna <laughs> so okay. So so uh, oh, you joining his bits? No, that's how it works, guys. <laughs> I'm very sorry okay. you need to have the other side. <laughs> so no, nobody. So you you are with me on, on this? Uh, is there anybody on, well, on the other is side? There anybody who thinks they will get it, or anybody employed by Think in the room by any chance? <laughs> no, nobody. <laughs> <laughs> okay, people are a little bit reluctant to join the bet, so there's only two of you for the time being. But go ahead. Okay, we'll, we'll this follow is, up on it. This is the, the landscape right now. So you know, uh, this is the landscape of uh, aggregators uh, uh, made by financial uh, uh, financial partners uh, daily. Uh, there are uh, you might say there are many, but I believe there are not so many players, and they are tackling this. Uh, uh, this job of uh, making open banking work, first of all, because I don't know how is the situation there in uh, in Brussels, but here in Central and Eastern Europe, open banking is not working at the uh, at the maturity stage of uh, of its uh, uh, of its uh, project. Let's say, uh, how is the thing? How are the things? I want to have some some interactivity with you. How are the things in in Belg Belgium? Since January is better, we had our largest bank not fully complying, not giving counterpart information. Um, I, I would always dare to say, uh, if you want to re report on it, because he's one of those in your slide here. Eh? So uh, we have uh, Ibanity and we have Banking SDK. Um, mm -hmm. So so you might already know him. I will pass the mic on. He's from. He can give you the perfect perspective on where they feel. Yeah, the yeah. Let's 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 do some interactive interactive interactivity here. I'm not supposed to speak as a teacher in front of a students. Yeah, yeah. So it's hard for me. Hi, <laughs> Jasmine. Um, happy to see you again. Um, see you. How are you? <laughs> good. Good. Thank you. Oh, I, I cannot see you because you're far away. But I believe you're my friend. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. He, 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 I can tell from the body language he's your friend. He even took his mask off so you could see him from <laughs> even from far away. Very nice meeting you guys. Very nice meeting you. Yeah. How's the how's the status yeah. of open banking there? Oh, they're, they're yeah. putting you in, so now you can look into his nostrils because you're so yeah. close to the camera now. Yeah. So it's yeah, okay. the camera there. Um, so the, the situation is in is is better now than six months ago. Uh, we start getting counterparties and stuff like that. So I would say that the top top 10 banks are sending us uh, now good data. And we have projects which are up and running uh, in terms of account information and payment initiation too. Um, there, there are a huge progress for the payment initiative part. It was okay. almost unusable one year ago. Um, today we have production projects with uh, payment initiation. So it's going better now. Um, and there are also huge progress in France, uh, which which is coming from very far. Um, I would say that Luxembourg is working fine. So no, it's it's better now, and I think that by the end, hopefully, we will we, we'll have good good situation with open banking. Uh, I believe we we price. spoke last time uh, half uh, half a year ago, uh, uh, yeah. isn't it? Uh, on this. So yeah, the, the point, how, how, how are things here in Central and Eastern Europe? Let me tell you, uh, you know, there is something that um, um, I use it as a strategy because we want to be some kind, somehow uh, the king of the lion uh, in the aggregation part here in Central and Eastern Europe. And because think, pled, true layer, and some others are not present here. It seems that they have a lot of work to do in uh, Belgium, Netherlands, uh, Germany, and so on. Uh, what we use here as a strategy is to uh, to be a technical service provider for the banks first, because if a bank is consuming the data from the other banks, then uh, they will somehow push it. And uh, this is what we are doing here uh, ourselves here in uh, in Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, this is uh, the countries that uh, we consider like our stronghold. Uh, okay, uh, there are countries like Poland and Czech Republic and Slovakia. As you know, for example, 
Czech Republic was on the first four countries that uh, translated the PSD2 implementation within their local uh, local uh, legal framework. Uh, they have their own uh, uh, API standards uh, on uh, the Czech Republic and so on. But still, there are countries like your Austria. Austria, you might think Austria like a, a, a developed, well-developed country, but they only have one bank that implemented account information only and i believe it's uh, uh, it's going uh, not so good hungary implemented only with one bank and that bank is by the way knh uh, knh which is kbc subsidiary in hungary so it's uh, the belgians are uh, are one of the pioneers of open banking in in in, uh, in central eastern europe and also in bulgaria there is a single one, only one bank that implemented account information uh, in their multi in their uh, uh, omnichannel in their digital mobile banking uh, and it is also uh, ubb which is a kbc subsidiary uh, we did our job in romania romania now has two banks uh, with account information and payment initiation we just launched yesterday so yesterday it was the first implementation of payment initiation in Romania with with the bank. Uh, right now, you know, our main concern right now is to push as much as possible because we can speak about a European payment initiative uh, based on open banking to fight with Visa and Mastercard. But the banks, although they are uh, very good in creating uh, creating committees, uh, they are not very good in implementing the things that they uh, they they say they want to implement and the real fight the real front is not because it's the same with berlin group you know berlin group was to create a standard for apis in psd2 and it was a mess right now all the apis are different there is no berlin standard it's a it's something that even they don't know what they wrote there let me put it this way uh, and uh, and here from from the front line it's like i don't care about this new initiative this new project okay we have this uh, legal framework is psd2 okay the game is over guys it's two years since you you need to have the apis up and running right now is 2021 june you need to make the payments work through payment initiation uh to the apis and this is uh, somehow uh, our uh, our stage here uh, i don't want to take more time from uh, from uh, from this uh, discussion but i'm here to answer any question and also here if you want to come and grab a beer in bucharest great it was a great introduction and it's uh, somehow reassuring because we many of us here look at it through our belgian lens that it, it can be worse because we thought we were struggling uh, <laughs> but it's it's, uh, it's somehow reassuring to know that uh, we're not the last in class here and the part of Europe is still not complying with this legislation from 2015. That's quite amazing. So, yeah, I'm thankful. All the, I would say good luck to you. We've come a far way. It's happening now. So if the first hurdles were taken, I expect things to get better from now on. I would like to pass uh, the stage to uh, Paul Scholten, who's the CEO of Bakuru. He's working from his home office somewhere in the Netherlands. Hi, Paul. Hopla. Yeah, Deva, we already heard Hi, you. Jamie. Yes, I, I'm on mute. I'm not on mute, so someone should mute. Can, can you hear me? You fine, you're the first stars without being <coughs> muted, so we get a okay. hang of this, you know, after for the rest Okay, of the very good, Go very ahead. good. Well, I think I would like to follow up on what Cosmin said, and <clears throat> I'll, I'll put things a bit into another perspective. I mean, the Netherlands is a country which actually doesn't like cards. It doesn't like credit cards. It's got a lot of debit cards, but in reality, <clears throat> and 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 it, it lacks for online, it lacks ideal, which is essentially an SCT scheme, which was semi uh, instant already some time ago by actually allowing <clears throat> ideal to block the balance on the account of the um, of the buying party, and thereby created certainty for the parties in a, in a uh, online transaction. Now, why do I start with that? I'm actually a bit from the uh, the PSP side. I'm a bit nonplussed by the complexity of the EPI initiative. Why? Because I think it originally started as an initiative to build on the strength of Europe, 
which is instant SEPA credit transfer. That's something that Europe is good at. Contrary to the US, which is much more card-based, and contrary to China, which is wallet-based. And the EPI became confused by focusing on what is essentially is a tentative by the French to expand carte bancaire into the whole of France. And honestly, why should we play the game of the Americans? Now, that's one thing. I don't understand why we are actually looking at card-based schemes rather than an SET-based scheme, which is already mostly in place, which is financed by the government, because at the end of the day, that's all put in place by the central bank, by the EBA and all the others. You don't even need to ask for funding. <clears throat> and it's being implemented. Now, that's one thing. The other thing is, I am convinced that there is going to be a lot of political pressure to get something out of the EPI. Why? Because the central banks, the European Central Bank and the banks are shitless of the big, te of the big techs. Uh, the, in the Netherlands, uh, the new uh, head of supervision of the Dutch National Bank came out in the press with a press article saying that we are going to be regulating the big techs big way. And they came out with a 50 page uh, supervision document. That's not being done because it has not been coordinated by the other central banks. He's simply the first one to do it. So there is going to be a lot of political pressure to get something done quickly. Um, that's on the one thing. The other thing is, I would like to comment on what Visa just did. Visa sends the, the wind. They're trying to take over Tink. They might get approval because there's more of these kind of players around. So they don't push out the competition. And they're, they're not stupid. They know where they, what, what's going to work in Europe. So that's one other thing. The second thing, and that's an interesting one, is the SEPA API initiative. That has been presented to the uh, European Retail Payments, uh, it's actually had been developed by the European Retail Payments Board. There's a lot of pressure on behalf of the large European retailers. It's been presented by the European Commission and to the European Central Bank. And it essentially should be solving for some of the issues that Cosmin came up with, i.e. Uh, it's going to put in place a scheme based on SEPA, uh, PSD2, um, essentially payment, in payment initiation, should set up a scheme which is going to be run by the European Payment Council and which will be getting, in principle, the Berlin Group, STAT, open banking in line also on the technical side. That could actually go much more quickly than setting up a pan-European uh, card scheme, which has to compete with Visa and MasterCard. So I think, um, and that's coming from a, a Dutchman who likes SET and doesn't like credit cards, uh, I think the European Commission and the ECB is going to push this initiative. I think the initiative is going to be much more easy to implement if it's based, going to be based on SET. And it will leverage what was already halfway available, i.e. the APIs from the banks, but then in a much more structured fashion. So on the one hand, I think the EPI is, uh, if we consider it attempt, a, a, an attempt to enlarge the um, carte bancaire to, on a European level, to, to me, it's that on arrival. If we think it's going to be the finishing of PSD2 and leveraging the SET instant infrastructure, which is already working in a lot of countries in Europe, and getting the banks in line on instruction by the European Central Bank that they should get the APIs in order, I think it should be able to work pretty quickly. It's, it's then, I, I, I love your, I love your in, uh, interventions because it's great debate material. I don't have to do anything here. So thank you for that, Paul. Please continue because you had a last point, I think. Yeah, I think the... Uh, <clears throat> The, uh, the, the, I think we look at it, and I think that's why it's interesting to see what's happening. I think everyone, and including ourselves, we're hatching our bets. Uh, we think, uh, as a PSP, we should be in this game. I think you see the same thing, the banks are moving in. There's uh, two of the, because there's 32 banks right now, <clears throat> which have moved to the ABI, but also two of the big acquirers. I mean, being Nets as well as uh, World, uh, Worldline. They're the two biggest in Europe. Uh, so there is going to, there is an interest and everyone is, is hatching their bets, but there's no, no clear decisions made yet. 
the same thing applies to the to the Dutch um, because we've got ideal. Uh, everyone is trying to position itself to be the one setting the standard in the European market. Um, uh, the Dutch are trying to do that with ideal 2.0. There's undoubtedly other initiatives going to be along that way. So it's going to be a very interesting. It's going to be an interesting situation. And I think most players in this market should be careful. Um, and I also like to think about what Bill Gates said. Uh, in two years time, things won't have changed that much. But in five years time or 10 years time, it will be totally different. So don't underestimate the ability of the European central bank and the European government to get something done because there's a lot of pressure behind it. That's a bit the along the lines of my um, of my introduction. Okay, great. And you, you Thanks. hinted at, at taking the bet regarding the Visa Think transaction. Which side are you on there? Your 100 euros, where do you put them for the record? <laughs> I think they might be able to get approval because that's, I mean, Think is, think is one company, uh, but there's actually quite a few others. There's Token, there's there's a number of initiatives, so uh, they won't be able to prove that they to they're totally taking the market. Yes, okay, that's very good. I I, I see that we have uh, Laurent uh, since, uh, also online. He works for Visa, so he he'll I think he'll be backing up your point of view there. <laughs> so he Laurent, will, of this, course. Is, this is your your moment to chip in here in the chat. Yeah, thanks for that. So uh, this is the part where we're gonna open up the discussion. Uh, the public discussion, so towards the audience, prepare your questions. I have a first one for you, Thibault. When, whenever we were still allowed to travel to France and you would be at any supermarket, we are talking about the card scheme, but they still have paper checks as like the main payment method. So I'm really having a hard time how France can set the record for Europe here, seeing how consumers still pay for a large part there. We have zero checks in Belgium consumer-wise. So can, can you tell us a little bit about that part? Well, you're, you're, you're a bit nasty because actually the exact number is that checks are used for 7% of payments in France. But, uh, but of I course, it's still, but it's 7% it's too much, obviously. <laughs> you're right. No, no, don't get me wrong. I mean, the carte bancaire system from the French perspective is very clever. The French banks have put their infrastructure together to issue cards and the the scheme works within france and by the way a long time ago it was on, working only in france which is a joke but then of course at the end they made a partnership with visa so actually the card bancaire cards are co-branded with visa so it means they are using the card bancaire scheme within france and visa outside uh, basically um, so of course they have the same idea for epi they say okay great why don't we put all our efforts as European banks together to have something which work within Europe and then we'll figure it out for outside of Europe? I mean, from a French perspective, it's, it's a perfectly rational thing to do. Great. Anybody else wants to start with a comment on that one? Otherwise, we're going to go straight to the... To, you're on mute and I'm going to have to ask the mic back, the microphone. Uh, so we have a first, we have a, I'm going to pause the questions on and you guys get to answer them. So first one, uh, will you get the, the pleasure to answer first and then we'll go to the one. Great. So, um, yeah, France, perhaps not the best example, but I think since it's been extended, we do have some counterweight, especially from, from some big hitters like, uh, like Germany, which is quite present. If we're looking at the Belgian banks, we have, uh, well, uh, three of the four large Belgian banks that are present there as well. There are still some notable exceptions. For example, Italy is completely missing from uh, from AP right now. But I, I think there's there, there's certainly potential there. And in Belgium as well, we have our own scheme. We have we have bank contact. And to come back to to what Paul said as well, um, is a card scheme the right way to go when we have these SIPA based payments? When we have APIs, as a Belgian who does like cards. Point of sales will still be very difficult to use SCT for purely without having a card-based product. Uh, think of how many times you go to a supermarket and you don't have signal reception. Um, we're a little bit slow in uptake here when it comes to mobile payments as well. So I think there's room for both in the market and it's not a question of and or. Pass your mic on. So. Fine, this light on this one. 
Uh, good evening. My name is Willem from uh, Treble here in Belgium. Uh, I just need a clarification. I what is the definition of Europe in this case? Is it the Eurozone? Is it the European Union? Is it Europe as a continent? That's the first question. I understand it's Eurozone. And secondly, then I think it's a dead born child because one of the big benefits of Visa, MasterCard is Forex, currency exchange. So if you can only work with a card in the, Euro, in the Eurozone, what's the purpose of it? I'm, I'm going to recover your mic. Maybe who wants to who wants to take the answer to that one? Thibault, maybe first. Um, well, basically, anyway, the coverage now is is not even EU. It's it's the banks which are part of the current club. And as someone said, Italy is not in it, etc. So so we'll see how how that works. Um, uh, that's for that's for the first one. For the second one, maybe Paul is better positioned than me to to answer that. <clears throat> in what sense? Which, the which which Europe? Ah, uh, which Europe? Uh, now, I think I think at the end of the day, uh, for me, Europe is the part that's been essentially been covered by the European banking uh, <clears throat> by the European Central Bank because that's the for me the mechanism that will be the part that will be the center of the whole universe in that respect. So what part is Europe is at the end of the day covered by the European Central Bank, which is essentially the Eurozone Plus. Uh, and I think there is something can be done. <clears throat> and I think it's interesting to see as well that we have other countries in the SEPA zone, such as Switzerland and as the UK. And the question will be if EPI gets uh, gets quite a successful, will it be able to extend there? Now, when, when it comes to your remark about it being dead uh, on arrival due to the FX component, I don't fully agree because we'll never have mono branded EPI cards. Your cards will always be a combination of EPI plus Visa or MasterCard. So if you're if you go abroad in a non Euro country, your card will automatically switch over to one of our American friends schemes. I have three questions from the audience. I'm going to start walking around here with my mouse back on. I'll take them in the order I saw them. So I'm very sorry. Sorry, will you introduce yourself and then uh, I'll give you the Hi, I'm Oliver. I work for a company that makes digital products and I was wondering how you guys see the evolution in the uh, with EPI and the digital euro. Are they competitors? Are they going to fortify each other? I, I don't know. I haven't heard anything about the, the digital euro, but I know ECB, you just mentioned, is working on it, is doing a lot of research. There's not a lot of information to be found today. Yeah, um, if I can start first. Well, it's a, it's a very interesting question. When, when you ask it to, um, to the guys from EPI, apparently their, their timeline is supposed to be much shorter than the digital euro. Um, that's the way they present it, is that they want to be ready very soon. And by the way, the digital euro officially, the, it's a project under study at the central bank, but the formal decision to proceed is not done yet. They should be taking that decision this summer. And by the way, from my perspective, the biggest risk of digital euro is a bank run. Uh, because the day we all have our accounts at uh, the central bank, the day there is a new financial crisis, the first things Europeans will do is to move their money from their traditional retail bank to the central bank. And then what happens? All the commercial banks are bankrupt. So that is something to think twice before starting a digital euro, um, at least in the way the Europeans want to do it. Because no one wants to do it the Chinese way, because that's it's too, um, too much invasion of privacy. And that's exactly what the Americans are saying. Um, so that's from what I know. But I'm sure Paul is more of an expert. I'm not an expert. I have the same questions. Because I think as essentially, <laughs> now, I think the, the big question mark with the digital euro is, is how it's going to be organized. Because as you said, Thibault, as you rightly say, if the central bank allows uh, individual consumers to open accounts at the central bank, they take away the banking system. Exactly. And I don't think I don't think the central bank is going to be doing that. So it will be it will be a cooperative system whereby the banks will still be playing a role, because otherwise, um, yeah, otherwise it's not. It, I fully agree. Otherwise, it's much too dangerous. And then the question is. Um, what is the the objectives of the digital euro the digital yuan is very clear the objective is to control the chinese population that's clear 
uh, the digital Facebook currency is it's in order to make um, <clears throat> make Facebook even richer than they are. But I think I don't think the ECB has already defined what digital euro should be should be used for. Uh, and before people that there is one interesting thing, and that's that's what came up with me. The digital euro is also a nice way to push banks, because at the end of the day, it's the the ultimate threat to the banks that the central bank can say, if you don't if you don't move, I will. So I'm not sure whether it will be used that way, but it, it's good. But and, and, yeah. Sorry, Paul. <laughs> no, go ahead. No, so I, I do think it will take some time because this is really a very substantial change in the system. Absolutely. When it comes to the digital euro, there are still a lot of key points that need to be decided. However, there are some things that have already been communicated by the ECB that are pretty much set in stone. Two of those things uh, would lead me to believe that the, the competition against IFI would be somewhat limited. One is that the ECB has stated they don't want to crowd out private market payments. Uh, they don't want to crowd out private money either. Um, and the second thing is that they said they don't want to explode their balance sheet. So they don't want to take on a much higher balance sheet. If we take those two things into consideration, and uh, as Anna, we did, uh, we did a study to see what exactly that would mean. If we assume that, uh, that the ECB would allow themselves to up their balance sheet by 50%, and to have a limited impact on payments, we could assume that the maximum balance on, an, on a CBDC wallet would be 3,000 euros. Now on payer side, that could be relevant. On retail side, that could be relevant. On payee side, that's, that's very limited. So we're looking at quite different use cases here. Great, uh, we have another question from the room, so I'll, I'll move over there. Also, the retail from FDW Consult Services. I have one perspective which was not highlighted by the speakers when compared, pairing the different payment models. And that is the payer model. Who is paying the fees? If you move to the SEPA credit transfer and the SEPA credit transfer instant, it is the payer who is paying the amount. If you move to card payments or wallet payments, it is the merchant who is paying, and that is a fundamental difference and when we discuss about payment means, it must also be taken into consideration. And the second perspective is that, and I observe because we're a big collector in the gaming industry, we see that the domestic schemes, be it in France, be it in Spain, Portugal, or in Belgium, are much less expensive than the international schemes and the wallet schemes in particular. And we see also that the problem of the chargebacks and the reverses and the frauds rates are much lower than in the other ones. What's your comment on that? It's a great question. And I think it's a little bit the elephant in the room, the rates. Who is making money today and where will they make it tomorrow? Uh, any of the speakers wants to address that? Because I, if you don't uh, answer immediately, uh, from, from what I know, and it was one of the things that surprised me, is when the banks all started pushing like Apple Pay and Google Pay, because basically they were giving away a large part of their fee. Because they, they were still the issuer, but they would team up and they would, they would yeah, go very well. But so they gave away almost, I believe it's more than half their share of those revenues. So it's, we're talking hundreds of millions of euros that they gave to the, the same GAFAs that they always say, they're going to come and disrupt us. And now they're giving them the revenue. So I'm trying to get my head around this. What's at play and what long-term strategy do they have for this? Thibaut, you want to start or, yeah? Yeah, I think, I, I, I go ahead. No, I mean, just, just as a reminder, from, from the general statistics that we know, in the credit in the credit card rail, okay, basically the commission is split in three, right? The issuer, the acquirer, and the scheme. Who gets the bigger share? The issuer. Then who gets the second biggest share? The acquirer. And then who gets a very small share? Our friends from Visa MasterCard. Okay? So that's very interesting is that we are trying to replace the the part that costs the less actually in the in the current in the current trail and then another remark why is t is instant payment so expensive but that's the next battle for the consumer associations and even the ecb why because actually it's not that expensive in terms of infrastructure but if my bank asks me 10 euro to do an instant payment well, basically they are taking a huge margin on it don't you think paul 
And to be honest, in the Netherlands, it's the same cost as a normal payment, which means it's free. That's, I mean, true. I can, That's the way I, to be. I can transfer Before money. I can I can transfer money from the Netherlands to France if, if it's instant payment. It's it doesn't cost me anything. So I think the, the I think it's a very interesting question. Who is going to make making the money? I uh, just to just to make one comment on what Thibaut just said. It's true that Visa and Mastercard take a very small share, share, but they do happen to be the most highly valued financial institutions worldwide. They have a market cap exceeding several hundreds of billion. So I think by taking a very small share, they're still be, they're still able to make a good living. That's that's <clears throat> that's one thing. Uh, no, I think the, the, the question in this case, and I think it's a very good one, and that's why it's actually the, uh, the, SEPA AP, uh, the SEPA API initiative is an interesting one, because there the European Payment Council will be defining the, uh, what the banks can charge other players in the system for value-added services. Because the PSD2 payment initiation is supposed to be free, but banks will be able to charge for payment for value-added services. Now, I think we will need to have some level of guidance or rule book or whatever in order to make the system work. But because unless people know what they can make money on, you will never get a market. And a market where banks charge 10 euros for instant payment is no, never going to be a market. So in that respect, uh, I fully agree with the, with the, with the person that it sh we should set out a clear definition of cost uh, and there should be an interest on the part of the banks to make money. I mean, one of the reasons that banks don't make the APIs effective is that they are afraid that they'll be losing out on revenues. The moment they realize that they'll be giving up revenues on the one hand, but able to make revenues on the other hand, you get a normal competition back. But at this point in time, it doesn't exist. I, I think we can all agree on, the, on that uh, remark, Paul. So thanks for putting it so clearly. Um, Kel, maybe you want to complement the last remark on this? Go ahead. Uh, yeah, so uh, when it comes to the interchange and who's making money, we're coming from the golden age. Um, it used to be that the interchange fees were extremely high uh, and banks were showering uh, their cardholders with all kinds of loyalty perks, which is still the case in America. Trip to, what, what, can you give us a little bit like, I heard about 1.4% is the total cost of a credit card transaction. That's kept for the cost. Is that, is that still accurate or has it gone down? I, I, I don't dare to say what the exact amount. Or Paul, you have recent information on that. No, I mean the, the it would start it would start around um, zero point five to two point five percent more or less, up to three percent. But that is the total commission which is paid by the merchant. Okay, yeah. so this is the one which is split in three, and the interchange itself, so which is the part paid by the acquirer to the issuer in Europe, is capped at 2% for a regular credit card transaction. In the US, you can go up to three times as much. We have, um, okay. I, have a, I have a very urgent in intervention from the audience of somebody who contradicts you. So I will ask him to state where he works and what his statement is. <laughs> Thibault, look, again. <laughs> I look. <live. laughs> no, no, you just mentioned 2% for interchange. It's capped at 0 0.2 for debit and 0 0.3 for credit. Yes, but uh, I mean, for, for, the, for, for, the section, uh, for the section which is due to the credit card scheme, I was, I was talking about the whole, uh, about the one paid by the from merchant, acquirer to issuer. The merchant service fee you, you refer to. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah, yeah but, not inter yeah, but you, you were re referring to interchange, I thought, so. You said interchange. Yeah, so that's inter because the, the I think the audience understood. It was a misunderstanding, but uh, we, we take your correction and it, it shows you're, you're pitching to a very knowledgeable audience. Huh? If you guys all know each other first name, I, I wonder what I'm doing here. Right? <laughs> <laughs> but we'll, we'll continue because Kale had the microphone. So look, if you want to, if you pass it on. We, we were on, on a stage on a different uh, two hours ago. So. Okay. Ah, okay. That's right. I'm going to give you some uh, alcohol. You get more upstairs later. Yeah. <laughs> so, so if you're wondering why your credit card doesn't give you lounge access, it's because of those interchange caps. And I think the general consensus is that those interchange caps will probably continue to come down. Um, I think also that's one of the reasons why AP could know some success compared to uh, instant, uh, compared to SET schemes, 
is that IPI can foresee some type of mechanism to incentivize the, the issuer, so the payer's bank, to, to partake in the scheme. I would say we can close this discussion with Laurent from Visa <laughs> writing down it's 0 0.3 max for credit card. So this closes our, our little misunderstanding here. Thank you, Laurent, for chipping in online. More questions from the audience. We also have a second room that's here, and we have a question in the first room. So I'll, I'll pass you the microphone. I'll bring you the alcohol afterwards. Um, I have a question on the request to pay scheme because we didn't talk a lot about that. And my question is to what extent do you think request to pay uh, will be able to take a part of the, the volumes uh, of the cards? Go ahead. We need to. I would say, Paul or Thibault, if you want to take it, we're waiting for a mic change here. So you can, you can start answering. It's a good question, but I don't have an estimate, frankly. I'm happy to take that one. So I think when it comes to request to pay and, and card schemes, a lot of banks are taking kind of a wait and see uh, approach. Why? Because we have AP, which is essentially a request to pay scheme plus some, some type of interchange mechanism on top of it. Um, now, I've heard contradicting echoes from, from AP, whether they'll use the EPC request to pay scheme if they'll base it on that and introduce change requests for that, or whether they'll develop their own request to pay type of scheme. Um, and, and again, so AP, we've talked a lot about card payments, but it also introduces the, the possibility to do wallet to wallet payments using, using request to pay. But the question is, which request to pay are we talking about? EPC or their proprietary variant? Great, thanks for that answer. We have the second room where everybody has been invited uh, to ask questions too. And if anybody online in the room chat, if you want to ask a question, you're still welcome to. It's a hybrid event, so we don't want you to feel left out of all the alcohol we're distributing already. And that we'll be distributing later in liquid forms upstairs too. So um, if there's no more questions um, yeah, from one of you, do any of you have an answer to, the, to my, uh, my opener? Why did they give away so much to the Google and the Apple Pay initiatives. What was the incentive to do that? Anyone else want to take that one? I, I can give it a shot, but uh, <laughs> well, my thinking is essentially that if one bank does it, then the rest need to follow at certain points because you know it's better to have a slice of the pie than uh, than none of it. And again, if interchanges are coming down, then your what you goes away anyway. So they know that this yeah. stream of revenues was going to dry up anyway in the future, so they took the commercial advantage, unique selling proposition of us being the exclusive contract with Apple or Google to launch in a country. Okay, that's an interesting point of view. Tibor or Paul, you have a different one. Yeah, <clears> no, it's 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 along the same lines. I think the banks actually introduced, at least in the Netherlands, I know that ING started introducing Apple Pay, and then the other banks followed, and it became quite. Uh, quite popular. I think the banks didn't realize how much money it was going to cost them because it actually replaces, uh, it forces them to pay out a lot of the interchange they make on um, on debit cards. Uh, that has had an, it has had an interesting impact because right now in the Netherlands they're working on Ideal 2.0 and the objective is to achieve the same level of customer experience as with um, Apple Pay. So it's very clear there is there is an objective. There was innovation, have outside innovation, and they want to bring that, copy it, and not make exactly. it more than the external cost. That exactly, exactly, exactly. Point. Well, you still have an, we have many more questions at once, so thanks for this. I want to draw one last analogy. Thibault, you mentioned that you were paying expensively for instant payments. Now, Thibault, if, if I remember right, you were based in Luxembourg, where instant payments is still relatively new. So there, banks are first moving, and they're still charging for it. What are we seeing in Belgium? We have banks like KBC and ING that are offering it for free. And now we're seeing other banks, Belfius included, that are starting to offer it for free as well, even offer it by default. So it starts out being charged and then... For now, for, for now. Clients, <laughs> yes. And, and important, I, I, I had bankers telling me, this is the biggest IT project which has cost the most for which we had no return investment. There was no... So he said, it passed the board, we had to do it, but... A, all the other projects have to prove how we're going to make money and instant payment was just accepted. We have to do it. We'll see how we make money. And it turns out it probably will not make money on it. Yeah. So 
it's a, it's a it's a sunk cost. They have to look back and and consider the uh, something that they did for their customers and that sets Europe apart from the U.S. and that might help in many of the other initiatives that all of you are developing here. So I look forward to those follow-up questions on this. I'm coming around with the mic, so fire your questions. Hi, I'm Thierry. So basically, I, I found uh, the uh, interchange discussion uh, very interesting. Interchange has historically been there for the issuers because they took a risk in the transaction. And this risk has been gradually over time diminished. So the, the, the cap on it, the SCA, uh, everything else, is basically minimizing risk on transactions, meaning it costs less to manage that risk uh, on the issuer side. So there's no reason to to charge for it basically now apple pay google pay also bring in a technology part that diminishes the risk on the transaction so that's why they asked for their share and that's goes down and that might be why uh banks are ready to pay for it because basically their their risk associated to transactions that they need to manage goes down so the cost associated to that goes down so interchange as a revenue at the bank is always a little bit double because it's actually there to pay for a cost on, on risk management. I would be curious if there's any bankers in the room with knowledge on this subject to tell us about the fraud rates because we all know that uh, through phishing and all sorts of new types of fraud, the banks are getting better at detecting it, also working together. We, I think Fibelfin is setting up an initiative. If there's anybody for Fibelfin, please uh, chip in here to enlighten us on it but to reduce the fraud with interbank information. I know the Netherlands has such initiative for a long time ago already, with, together with the government and as a separate company. So and that should also reduce the risk. Yeah? Yeah. Does anybody has any knowledge about this or can share anything about it in the room? The credit uh, yeah. risk remains. Uh -huh. Thank you for light, for <laughs> for sharing that important observation. The credit risk remains. Yeah. That's why and, it's still called a credit so, card, right? And so this is where it gets interesting in the in the in the EPI payment scheme because it's basically a a SEPA scheme with irrevocable uh, and final transactions, and so there's no way from a credit risk perspective to 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 get that money back. So if you have a merchant accepting instant payments, basically he gets his money and he's sure about the money so your your risk assessment your underwriting of that merchant is slightly different than with, than with credit cards also big thanks for uh, the, did you have a, a question yourself because you're answering a previous one now so <laughs> yeah i i have a question uh regarding the epi uh introduction here because we, we we've briefly discussed and touched on some subjects like chargebacks uh but there's also use cases uh, that are very prevalent with, with cards like hospitality, uh, where you book a room and then you pay for it uh, a month later, for example. Those are use cases that even Bank Contact, local scheme, doesn't support. Uh, another one is where you buy stuff online, so not cash and carry, and it's actually sent three days later. In, in, in general, you should not charge it uh, at the time of the order, but you should charge it as soon as it leaves the warehouse. Now, this is interesting, and, and so Paul uh, is from the Netherlands, and I think ideal and customer protection uh, is a thing there. And the fact that you pay before you receive the goods has been a big discussion uh, in Holland uh, also. So, Can you tell us about that part, Paul, the consumer part of when you charge because you get the hold of the goods or supposed to get hold of the goods uh, the interesting thing is that they've been able to convince all the dutch to, to do it <clears throat> so for whatever reason yeah. people <laughs> people people in the netherlands have been trained to pay before they receive the goods which is actually quite interesting and it works it's been working for years it's it's been even it's amazing amazing you have so many anti-vaxxers if they managed to it was it was 15 years ago so maybe people changed but uh, no, it's even it's even a different scheme because eff effectively, at the time it was introduced, the banks couldn't move the funds instantly. So what they did, they got a second, they got around it by blocking the account, uh, blocking the amount on the account of the uh, of the consumer. So essentially, what you did, you did an ideal transaction. An ideal transaction was a promise to pay in the bank, 
and there was a blockage on the amount. So the amount was kept back and then the, the interbank uh, clearing run it was settled the day after. And <clears throat> so people would think they would be paying already, but of course the money was technically still on the account. But yes, I do agree. It's an interesting situation where you got the whole population confident about receiving the goods. Maybe it's also a positive applause for all those web shops that so far hasn't the trust hasn't been I would violated in that respect because then people would no longer do it. Because right? there's, to my knowledge, there is no big scandal of people paying large amounts to well-known web shops and not getting the goods or getting follow-up there. I'm not Dutch. Okay, so we have some drop shippers here in the audience that know about scandals, but I haven't read about them in the press. Let me put it that way. Is there, did we miss something big, Paul? Is there something going on with people coming back on the, on the, delivering on the promise of delivering once you've paid? Not no? really. Not no. really. Okay, so no, no, uh, yeah. no, no. Yeah. So, so, so with AP, the the focus on instant payments is for the settlement of the payment. There's still the idea to have the authorization rails based on on the current existing infrastructure. And when we're looking at pre-authorization use cases and those type of things, that's happening on authorization level and not on settlement level. So I don't see uh, a blocking factor there. And even if that authorization part would be done using um, using uh, EPC schemes, the request to pay scheme as it's been developed also foresees pre-authorization and, and those type of things. So uh, I would assume that those things would be included in the scope. Um, this is the nice thing about hybrid meetings. You can invite people you've talked about. So we have uh, Laurent, in a sense, from from uh, from Visa. Right? So you can speak out. You have to be careful because I'm now you're now uh, ventilating the official point of view of your employer. Uh, but lots has been said. So please comment on some of the things. Uh, we know you can't. Uh, the camera has an issue, but well, you are unmuted, so we can hear you. Laurent, uh, we're listening to you. Yeah. Hello. Good. Uh... Evening. No, I just wanted to, to, to comment on the, the previous question or two questions ago already that was about the the cost for issuers and uh, asking for banker. I'm not a banker, obviously, but uh, I think looking just at the risk part of the cost is, uh, is uh, uh, I mean, it's not sufficient. Obviously, the, the risk part is only a small part. Certainly, if we talk about debit cards, where the risk uh, is, is very small. Uh, credit is, of course, slightly higher. I don't think we've seen a, a huge reduction of risk over the last few years. Now, I will be really interested to to see the, um, that reduction when when this PSD two and SCA gets into full force, uh, which is now. So, but we will only see the, the resultant fraud in the, the the coming months, you know. But I think looking at the cost, um, the cost of fraud. Maybe it's not paying for fraud anymore, but it's cost for fighting against fraud and getting systems protected and 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 when you look at the, the full costs of for, for issuers you have to to i mean the, the larger share is probably processing also operations of of the, the 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 system and and fighting against fraud and all the scoring and all the intelligence you need behind um and the management which is more and more expensive compliance is also an increasing cost that, as a came out in the press recently when you see that banks are uh, saying that their, their cost of compliance increasing like 16% per year or I mean something just amazingly high. So um, yeah, just, in just looking at the reduction of cost is maybe not. Uh, the is a, of people at Visa Laurent working on, on I would say, the, the fraud follow-up, the complaints from both the issuers that ventilate them back to you and you alerting the issuer that they should block a card. Is it kind of, like, do you have any idea about how many people are employed in the credit card scheme anti-fraud uh, operations? I, I couldn't provide a number, definitely, but it's 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 definitely quite significant. Yes, absolutely. Okay. And and I think that yeah, that's something we 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 are proud of in in card schemes. I mean, it's it's basically the the fraud protection and also all the chargeback and the guarantees we we give as Visa or Mastercard also. To, to, to basically um, consumers and uh, they, they know that uh, when, when they use the card or when they don't use it, they, they're protected against fraud and, and, and all those risks. We have three more minutes, so I'll, I'll, I'll give you a closing remark and I will go on with the other speakers. Some a takeaway, something you want the audience to think away uh, to talk about when we have our drinks uh, after this public session. 
uh, Laurent, you, you get to be the first one. <laughs> something, something you learned or something you want us to take into account uh, about tonight or anything that has been said. I know uh, I can do all a little bit. I, I can't there. say, yeah, I can't say much about EPI. I mean, uh, Visa is still in the, in the, in the point of uh, defining exactly opposition with regard to it. So th there is no clear uh, statement at this stage yet. Okay. It's just a bit early. Um, but we're really curious to see how it evolves and, and we will be definitely supportive of it uh, if, if something comes out. As was mentioned before, obviously, Europe is one thing. I think people want their cards to be used or their payment means to be accepted everywhere on the internet and in, in the world. Uh, so I think uh, that the visa acceptance and visa uh, brand is very strong in that respect. Yeah, I think and you, you rightfully mentioned Visa MasterCard uh, to be the global players there. So yes, it's a, it's a USP that is very hard to copy for anybody else in the world. So uh, congrats on, on, on securing that one. Thibault, what is your takeaway of uh, this debate? It's a very optimistic note. We are very lucky to live in Europe, guys. Why? Because in China, of course, they have Alipay and WeChat Pay. Okay, but it's an oligopoly. And we know that in one snap, the Chinese government can control whatever they want. Okay. And in the US, okay, they have great fintechs, but as we know, they are nowhere near where we are in terms of instant <coughs> payment, right? So, and also in the way we've applied open banking, okay, there's a lot of problems with implementing PSD2, but at least it gives a, a, a continent-wide scale to any European player, and it gives a level playing field. So if you combine that all together, yes, it's fantastic because as a consumers, EPI will work or not, digital currency or not. We have plenty of players, plenty of schemes, plenty of choice, and that's the way it should be. Thanks for that positive message. Paul, you want to close? You get the last words to yeah. close this thing. Uh, actually, <clears throat> I'm actually quite positive as well, but for a different reason. That uh, I, I, what I notice is that the, 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 the bankers, the central banks, and the ECB start realizing that they've got to do something in order to really protect Europe against uh, an invasion from outside. And that has always been a good, uh, the Europeans, I mean, uh, just what Thibault said, <clears throat> China is only two schemes, the US basically also two card schemes. And I think Europe is still a bit uh, more creative in terms of the different countries. In order to come together, it's always good to have a common enemy. And I think the European banks and central banks found a common enemy which is probably a good thing to get something done. So I'm positive about getting the EPA, API or something similar off the ground. And we should all be watching what's going to happen in three to five years. Thanks for that one, Paul. Uh, Kelt, you get the last word because you're the physical uh, speaker here. So it's the last, last word. Go ahead, you get it. Thanks. Um, so I just want to give a little bit of an update on when we can expect updates on this. So EPI today is an interim company that's been funded by the participating banks. They have received funding until up to the end of this year. Now that funding also includes the, 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 the money they need to decommission the company. So that means by October, November at latest, a decision will be need to be made. Will EPI com company continue as a, as a full company? So not just as an interim company. So it's really moving now that decisions are being made at this time. Um, the last remark I have is that, well, we have Visa on the line, but, uh, but not MasterCard, but they did a fantastic thing buying Euroclear all these years ago. So all the European banks, they, they uh, sorry, not Euroclear, um, <laughs> um, Eurocard. They sold Eurocard for some 500 million euros many years ago, and now they're going to spend billions rebuilding the same thing. So. I think the banks might be looking with a bitter taste at, uh, at that sale. <laughs> I really like the historic perspective so many of you has, have given us here. So uh, the, the Euro card is new to me. I wasn't even aware of that one. So thanks for enlightening that one. Um, at the end of our talks, we always, of course, thank our great speakers uh, uh, for being here, our great audience for showing up online and in, the, in presence again. Uh, we look forward to doing more and more events in the upcoming months. Uh, there is a slide on our next events to come, so with that we will wrap it up. So, uh, the 9th of September, we have our hybrid meetup on open banking, the PSD2 barometer, mainly the Belgian situation, but it's, we will, might also update the Eastern and Central European uh, situation to learn how well they've done compared to today. 
We have a hybrid classroom um, uh, partnering strategies with uh, Cresco. And we have another hybrid classroom, the 28th of September, on SEPA Instantainments with uh, Azana, who's already represented by Kelt here. And then we have a summit, uh, which is our, our big, big summit, the Digital Finance Summit. It's, it's going to be a, a very uh, hybrid edition this year. We're still looking at the exact form. Uh, it's going to be very exclusive for those who will attend in presence. That's all I can reveal already. So get your wallets out because that will be our pitch for you to attend and, and uh, sit at a table with your dear colleagues and competitors that you've missed for two years, right? And with that, we are going to our physical drink. You can, you can follow our events calendar for everything we do, our newsletter. And if you have anything and want to organize an unmissable event, Alessandra and Jamie are your go-to persons here in the back of the room here. So thank you, everybody. Again, also, um, the last, uh, you see, I get these slides. I have to bring this last message. We have the fire hub opening up in the central station. If you are canceling your FinTech offices, this is a great place to take a few seats. We will be there, FinTech Belgium. And so it's right in front of the central station. No more need to get in traffic, uh, which you're no longer used to anyway. And so we look forward to welcoming you there uh, as soon as it opens, uh, I believe it's September, right? So with that, we really close. Let's have some drinks. Let's uh, talk to each other and uh, keep safe in the meantime. Everybody, bye-bye. Thank you. And a big thank you to you as well, Tone, for, for moderating this conference. My pleasure. Thank you.